Welcome to Quest from Insights Live and the Cicillo Institute for Ethics in the Global Economy webinar series. I'm Dave Epstein, Executive Director of the Cicillo Institute, a part of Boston University Questrom School of Business, which examines issues and explores solutions to global ethical challenges in business. So I was, I was reading a fascinating book called The Right Side of History by Ben Shapiro, where Jeff Goodby explained his concern with the changing face of advertising, with a push toward individualized marketing, using data mind about each of us, advertising is as much a data science discipline as it is a creative art to move larger swaths of the population. And that was written well before ChatGPT, Dolly2, and other AI platforms existed that mimic creativity. So this sparked my interest into digging deeper. So uh, let me introduce Jeff Goodby, who probably needs no introduction. <laughs> Uh, Jeff is a Harvard grad who wrote for the Harvard Lampoon and has illustrations in Time, Mother Jones, and Harvard Magazine. He met Hal Reine, his mentor, and Rich Silverstein at Ogilvy and Mather, where Jeff learned his reverence for surprise, humor, craft, and restraint. Jeff and Rich founded Goodby Silverstein and Partners in 1983 with a founding client that they renamed Electronic Arts. Since then, the two have won just about every advertising award imaginable. Jeff's work has been displayed in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 2006, and he was inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame in Fame. In 2019, he and Rich received the Cannes Lion of St. Mark Award for Lifetime Achievement. Jeff lives in Oakland, California with his family, and we heard maybe more than one dog, sometimes a cat, three horses, and some other things that he probably doesn't know about. <laughs> so joining Jeff, I'm pleased to introduce Kathy Kiley and Professor DK Lee. After 25 year marketing and advertising career, Kathy serves as president of the Ad Club. With over 12,000 members, it's one of the largest trade organizations of its kind. Under Kathy's direction since 2005, Ad Club significantly grew memberships and sponsorship, built premier professional development, scholarship and mentoring programs, and holds yearly events, including the Hatch Awards, Ross Up Awards, the Edge Conference, and Legends Night. Kathy graduated from Massachusetts College of Art and Design and has served on its board of trustees. She's also a board member for Big Sister Association of Greater Boston and serves on the board of overseers for Boston Innovation. DK is a professor of information here, uh, information systems here at Questrom. He studies responsible application, development, and impact of AI and generative AI in business, particularly in innovation, social media, advertising, and creativity. DK is widely published in leading journals and conferences and has racked up awards, including ISS Gordon B. Davis Young Scholar, the Marketing Science Institute Young Scholar, Best Paper and Teaching Awards, and Management Science Distinguished Service Award. His work uh, of supporters include Adobe, Google, and McKinsey. DK holds a computer science degree from Columbia, a master's from Yale, and a PhD from Wharton. Not too shabby. <laughs> Before <laughs> academia, DK worked at BlackRock, Thomson Reuters, and four different tech, tech startups. So uh, please use the Q&A tab to ask questions. I'll save time at the end for as many as we can get to. Please feel free to use the chat during the discussion otherwise. So let's get started. So, Jeff, could you start us out with a historical perspective, maybe of advertising over your career, your storied career? Uh, we can are especially interested in creative content of ads and how it's been done and how it's evolved over the years, and maybe how automation evolved with it. So that's not too much to do. Dave. No, yeah, um, that's, I was going to say, Jeff, that's all unfair. <laughs> in a minute or less, of course. <laughs> Well, I've always thought of advertising as like the biggest exploration of who we are in the world. And it's corporate funded, you know, which is amazing. Um, it, 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 it searches out like what we love and what we hate and what we're afraid of. And, you know, um, and, and just all, all, all kinds of things about us. And that's that's been true for a long time. And it'll stay true going into the future, I think. You know, Kathy and I have worked in a time when humans were making all the advertising and then humans plus AI, which is kind of what we're in right now, which is a really interesting time. And maybe maybe we're just a chapter. Maybe humans are just a chapter to something where 
the AI makes everything, who knows? You know, maybe we'll diminish to zero. Um, I hope not. Um, I started doing this in 1978 um, and commercials were, were fun. They were kind of a shared experience. You know, like when you went to the water cooler, somebody would know what you had done. You know, they'd talk about it. And, um, and that's, that's very rare now, very rare. Like that's probably the biggest change since that era. Um, but sh you shared things and you shared, um, you shared magazine ads, you shared outdoor ads. Everybody saw the same advertising. Not true anymore. That kind of advertising was intrusive in our lives. And what we did was I think we figured out ways to get around the intrusion in many ways. You know, we got controllers and things that record TV shows and so on. And, we, and in time, like, you know, we did away with a lot of the uh, intrusions of advertising. And um, the only advertising that we really watched was during live events, like the Oscars or the Super Bowl. That's, that was when we watched advertising. We don't really take it in, you know, involuntarily. We take it in voluntarily now. If we want to see it, we see it. If we don't, and, you know, and the advertising people, you know, we don't put up with that. <laughs> we like find ways around it. So, you know, the internet was a way around that. Um, individual targeting. You know, the, um, the thing that we call mass intimacy at my office, which is to talk to lots of people at once, but in a way that makes it feel like it's just about you. How did they know this about me? And that comes about because of data mining, because of the amount of, of, uh, of data that's, that's scraped from our lives, something I'm not happy about. Dave's read my, my um, essay about that. I'm not happy about that. It obviously been misused in social media and one of the things I don't like about the industry. So, you know, um, I think the thing about AI is, you know, for, if, um, right now, you know, you can create content with it, we, you know, and we kind of control that content in many ways. And we're going to talk about this. Um, AI can target the content, and make it even better. Um, the thing that's dangerous about it is, of course, that it emulates sounds and images and so on. And in advertising, that's what's going to be what we talk about today, I bet. Uh, and that won't be okay, because um, it will be somewhat out of our control. So that's my history of advertising for the last 40 odd years. There are still, you know, there's, you know, we do a campaign that you probably will know in Boston for Sam Adams beer with this cousin from Boston guy that, um, you know, there are still things like that, that when you get in a cab, you can talk to a person about it and they've seen it, but it's more and more rare. It's more and more rare. It's That's, a good thing uh, you're from. It's a good thing you're from Rhode Island, Jeff. That you got away with doing your cousin from Boston. Uh, you know what? You guys will appreciate this. I, when we when we originated that, I said to the people working on it that Massachusetts, maybe New England in general, is the only place in America that takes it as a compliment that they're being like made fun of. That they're being <laughs> mocked. It's so yeah. true. It's so <laughs> true. And mocked by you know. Um, it's people who are desperately trying to get the accent right. So we get a kick out of that. So Kathy, maybe maybe you can uh, introduce a little bit into what you see as creativity in ads over the years, since you've seen many. God, I don't, you know, Jeff, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but, uh, and, and DK, same to you, but I've been in advertising. So I started in 78. I graduated Mass College of Art in 1978 so um jeff you and i are sort of in the same timeline and i've been told a hundred times that it was the end of advertising that we were going to be replaced replaced and something was taking over and it, and it was it just never happened i feel like technology has always been you know a friend um since Leonardo Leonardo da Vinci she mixed art and science together, um, I've always felt like it's been some like a simpatico relationship. Um, I get a little, you know, as I read about what artificial intelligence can do, I, I get a little nervous about it. But I, but I'm, and we talked about this a little bit prior to this, but I feel like. There's a, there's a, it's like having a job insurance 
if you're a really good creative person. And Jeff, you certainly have this job insurance. It's like there's a part of your brain that I don't think artificial intelligence will ever duplicate. That is what puts you in touch with emotion and being able to read a person's feelings and um, trying to think of another way of saying it. I don't think that can ever be duplicated by artificial intelligence. And I think the artificial intelligence that we're looking at now and, you know, um, could never come up with gut milk, you know, that campaign would never happen. That's, that's like a piece of your brain that's just so rare and so unique. And so I'm, I embrace technology all the time. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm brilliant at it, but I, I'm never afraid of it. Well, that's, that's a good, that's, that's a good uh, segue into, let's hear from, uh, from DK a little bit. Um, DK so, being uh, of a very different generation. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I also uh, graduated with master's in 78. So I think we're all yeah. contemporaries. And I think DK is just our, our good thing DK here, is but, here. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good to have somebody who actually has grown up with real technology yeah. like this. So DK, yeah. uh, so a lot of us have been impressed by the recent uh, capabilities that we've seen with uh, chat GPT, of course, that's all over the news now, and and people are using it, and Dolly 2, and Stable Diffusion, and Bard now with Microsoft, but you've been studying this for, for many years, and generative AI, in fact, as well, so for you, this is no big surprise, but how, maybe you can kind of give us a feeling about how creativity um, is Im embedded in these programs, or how they, they, they look, and 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 is it the intent to be a partner to humans or are they going to replace humans? <laughs> yeah, that's uh that's yes a or no. question. So <laughs> yes or no. Well uh quick, right, well, quick. yeah, it's not no, a okay. <laughs> yes or no question. So <laughs> currently I think it's uh uh for augmentation, uh, of course. Uh it it does a lot of um you know, it can be used not only for brainstorming, uh, but uh, combinational creativity is quite uh, accessible with these models, right? So uh, a lot of times, uh, I guess it's it's being it's currently being used to, uh, you know, artists would prompt things and then get some outputs and then, uh, you know, fix on top of that uh, for ChatGPT too, right? So um, what these models are good at is it is able to um, soak in what's on internet, right? So all of these models do learn from internet and what has been stored in data, but that's that's the current limitation. So as Kathy mentioned, right, the emotion is hard to encode right now. I mean, for now. So oh. you know, <laughs> I, I'm not going to make any yeah, I mean, I I won't be making any predictions, right, uh, about how the technology will evolve. I don't think anyone knows. Uh, uh, I'm sure people are working on a bunch of different things. Uh, for now, we, we it, it, computers do not have access to that. So all they have is some sort of uh, aggregate reactions that we make, uh, but it doesn't have the high resolution emotion that individuals feel because it's not digitized. Uh, again, like you know, when will that happen? Who knows. But without that as data uh, to train these model, uh, I think we're we're you know what Kathy has been saying, uh, what Kathy has said is true, right? Um, it's 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 not possible right now. Um, so, but do, so you, do right you think now, do you think that piece of the human brain that, and I'm I'm really curious about this because. That, this is the only part of this that frightens me. Do you think that part of the human brain that senses an emotion and can, can write a music lyric or can tap into what's, what I'm feeling, do you think that can be duplicated into artificial intelligence? Uh, I mean, it can certainly be trained to mimic it even chat gpt even though it has a semblance of understanding it's just uh you know getting some you know 
it has soaked up statistical regularities of uh, internet language and you know also the photos and it's mimicking it so it's not i'm not sure if it's we can truly say it's understanding this argument goes right. back to like 60s i think the chinese room argument the original you know when the ai first started right uh, we'll, we'll, but what i think that it currently lacks is uh it lacks the not only the context the individuals feel and see all the uh, things that cannot be digitized is totally missing right like muscle memory uh senses some senses not not audio and video um you know but like taste is got it's not it cannot be captured um tactile muscle memory yeah uh, any and anything yeah, that cannot be yeah. Visited, yeah you know what it is good at though is juxtaposing things i think and it can learn a lot from that i was thinking about you know like um eisenstein's film um cutting when he first invented that idea of he took that woman you take a woman that's crying and you put it cut it together with a gravestone and you go, oh, she's crying about the gravestone and suddenly you get an emotion. I think that an AI can learn how to do that. You know, I mean, can learn how to juxtapose things and go, oh yeah, when this DK guy did that little thing where he juxtaposed those two images, everybody cried, I'm gonna remember that and use it, you know? I mean, I think that's gonna happen. It's gonna, it's gonna start to understand how to make emotions out of, out of things like that which is totally predictable, I think. Yeah, um, that's, that's, uh, that's an interesting, interesting point about um, it also it learning uh, as you know, okay, it, it, didn't, it didn't come up with got milk, but now that it has that in its lexicon, uh, it may choose something different that were that we'd be surprised that it, it combined one with another just because it now does it. And as we do it more, it learns every time we come up with something that's that's innovative, and um, and it and it gets better, right? I, I, that's what it is. Uh, there, one thing that you said before, uh, Jeff, that I, I want to come back to is is you mentioned kind of the water cooler idea of people sharing information. Um, does will AI replace that? In other words, will it become the mentor, or will it become the idea generator that then? causes the human to come up with something new it is can, can we get a because people aren't talking to each other but you always have the ai to talk to you does it become our partners it certainly will spur us to to be better i think that there's something about the ai that you know it'll spur us to be to to try to be better to do things that the ai can't do you know i think uh, you know, I, I think of that doll, Salvador Dali painting of the melting clocks, and I go, you know, AI is not going to come up with a melting clock painting unless a human goes, put some, make a painting with melting clocks. <laughs> it, it's not going to do that. It's going to take a long time before the AI does something like that. But it'll do things like that pretty randomly. We did a, we did a new business pitch using, um, I think it was Dali too and um in a really early version of it and it came up it came up with headlines that you would never come up with you know it was for a it was for a, a alcohol beverage thing and it came up with a headline that said it's what they drink on the sun like no human would write it's what they drink on the sun and um it, but you have to go through like thousands of headlines to find that headline it's a very inexact tool right now um, it'll get much more so like DK saying, uh, it'll refine itself, it'll start understanding those juxtapositions and that, that we find, we are the masters of this, that we're still, at least for now, that, that we find interesting, it'll understand those juxtapositions that we find funny and, and moving, you know. So what, a question came up from, uh, from Neuro, um, he asks, do you believe the emergence of smart devices has led to the shorter attention span for people and therefore specific targeting of ads with AI? Um, and and I combining that question with you know short attention spans and maybe um, more quick advertising, might it be that that AI can start doing some quick short things uh, and leaving the harder things to humans? Um, or or is 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 that it's, it's already doing that it's already doing that 
I mean, you know, people are generating ads already with AI for situations like that. The thing that an AI can't do right now is sort of tell an appropriate story around the product and its reason to be and so on. It, it, it can't do that yet. And stories are incredibly motivating to us as humans, you know. Um, but I, like you're saying, the, the short attention span thing is real. You can't tell a very complex story in a short attention span. And yet, you know, a short a short uh, burst is a, is a useful advertising tool. So the AI is going to do that job for sure. It already is in many cases. Yes, in fact, in Netflix, uh, everybody, every one of us get each different uh, you know, thumbnail and a short uh, preview of the video. They personalize that on the fly for individuals. They have been doing that. Yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm depressed. <laughs> yeah. and Jeff, do you think, do you think, and DK, same question for you, that creative people will, could be replaced, like, let's say someone who comes up with the script for a movie, you know, or more importantly, a novel, you know, or do you think Ultimately, they could be replaced by artificial intelligence and, and have it be meaningful. It depends so, on what meaningful means. I think, I think have artificial it, have intelligence- it do. Have it resonate, because so you're not, so you don't feel like you're reading something that was produced by somebody without a soul, you know? Hey, this, this is the biggest question that I get is will creative people be replaced at some point? You know, we were talking about that. I, 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 think, I think they won't be, but they'll learn to use this as a tool. So they'll, a guy yep. that's writing a script will come to a certain point. Oops, sorry. A person that's writing a script will come to a certain point and they'll go, wow, I need, I need an ending on this thing. How am I going to end this thing? And you can ask the AI to help you with an ending. I, I think that will start happening, you know? Yeah. Um, well, what do you think, DK? Yeah. Uh, so going back to what we've been saying, uh, you know, what is these? What are these AI tools capable of? Um, it's it's easy to confuse. I think human intelligence with uh, these artificial intelligence, right? So artificial. I like to say artificial intelligence doesn't care if the content is quantum mechanics or uh, children's story. Uh, if it has enough data. Uh, it can mimic the statistic, uh, statistical regularities uh, and have a good semblance of knowledge. So going back to this, uh, this feelings, I think, you know, I, I guess Jeff mentioned also that it can probably try to mimic that uh, if we get digitize that enough, right? So uh, in terms of creativity, so I guess the Bowdoin uh, has a requirement, three requirements for uh, artifact to be creative, uh, novel, surprising, and valuable. So algorithmically, it is totally actually easy to come up with novel and surprising algorithmically. Now, it, it depends, like the last part of the creativity, the value, uh, which we give. I mean, we always have to give it a value, right? So we are the arbiter of whether this, in this context, this advertising is heartwarming or whatever. So we are the arbiter of the value. So in that sense, we'll, we'll have to provide it a lot of data in a lot of different forms before it can try to mimic it. But there are ways to try to teach the algorithm to mimic it adversarially, uh, showing an example, soak that in. So when will that happen? I, I don't know, but for now, I think it's a very good uh, idea you know, you can bounce ideas off of it. You can also tell uh, algorithms to explore what it's good at is it's the scalability, right? So it can incorporate all kinds of different knowledge uh, from all kinds of different fields and then juxtapose, juxtapose seemingly unrelated things. And humans like you know, the masters of creatives like Jeff and Kate, Kathy yourself will be then the arbiter. So yeah, that looks good. This looks good. That that looks terrible. Yeah. I think I think taste is a big thing. You're right. I, I mean that that'll be a role in a way to keep because the AI will have a way of like making good be okay. 
instead of instead of making great. You know, we'll start to think good is okay. And it's our role to not let that happen. It's our role to to want it to be better, to make it funnier, to make it more moving, to make it more beautiful. Yeah. And that's that's what our role is going to be, I think. Taste is going to be a big thing and the ethics are going to be a big thing. I think you know, I know that that this that this uh this class is about ethics to some degree. I think that's going to be a big question going forward. You know, the ethical use of this stuff. Big question. Yeah, part of part of that, and um, in in the ethical part. I mean, um, so you mentioned, you know, no, maybe nobody would have come up with a melting clock from, but now it can come up with a melting cat or a melting house or a melting whatever, right? It it it, it can once you get it melting, it'll do that, <laughs> right? Um, but and and what if it, instead of you know got milk you know got a bike or something like that comes up then how do you, how do you, the humans have already done that part. well what happens yeah. yeah humans do it but but how do how do you protect your your own intellectual property if you will I mean then if it's just copying you it because it's it is copying right I mean that it, it's mimicking. So it's it's copying. So how do how do people feel about you know you're you're mimicking me? I could probably say, write me a commercial that is like Jeff Goodby would write it, and it might come up with one, right? And then do you own that or do they own that or how do you feel? Well, the people at my place did exactly that. They fed everything that I'd written into an AI and had it learn it, and then asked it to write things. And it and it was uncannily good and funny at it, but you know, it, it, you can't you can't ask it to do everything. It, it's it, it won't. It'll give itself away. You know, it, it'll give itself away as not being me. If you if you kind of push it hard enough, and that's what I mean about having high standards. I think our standards. We have to be careful not to relax our standards on this stuff because once our standards go down, we'll start accepting the stuff that this thing makes. And think it's just fine, and and we are we are lazy. We'll do that. Well, Jeff, I was going to say half of the pharmaceutical advertising on the planet, yeah, yeah. almost a hundred percent of it could be written by artificial intelligence. I mean, it's yeah, just so it's, it's so insulting. Yeah. It's insulting. So, it is. Uh, so Fred Geyer's on the line too, and he asks, uh, "Hi, Fred." So he asked. Um, it could definitely, he's first as it could definitely do how Reiny adds. So that's <laughs> an interesting thing. Um, that's he so also, <laughs> he also asked, um, how do we factor in the fact that digital media uh, last year for the first time has overtaken traditional advertising spending uh, on an annual basis in the US, even without AI? So how does, does that factor into this in, in some way? It might be positive. It means that there aren't so many juniors writing banner ads <laughs> in the night. <laughs> I'm surprised last year was the first year it overtook it. I'm very surprised to hear that. Yeah, it's yeah I mean, prevalent. I, I mean, it's ever, it's like hmm. once again. I think that I think that that's a misleading statistic because yeah, you know, who knows what it's replacing. And what the level of quality is, I'm I'm hoping that there's still a level of quality at the top of this stuff that that it can't do, and so that maybe that shouldn't scare us. Maybe what it's doing is doing things that really most of us don't want to do, you know. Yeah. Look, so, uh, Kate asks, do you think the quantity, the quality of advertisements are going to go down because companies will push AI generated ads out quickly? Rather than taking the time, so it's it, are we going to be dumbing down the ads in general, and then does that does that uh, raise the quality of the people generated ads? I mean, that, that's the second half of that. It's a really, really good question. It, you know, in many ways, it is the question. Again, it's about the standards of taste that DK was talking about. You know, if we continue to maintain some kind of higher standard of taste, then we'll have a role. If we don't, then that stuff will take, it'll, it'll, it'll just take over because, you know, many times we, we like the cheapest, fastest, um, you know, not necessarily best solution. We, we accept it. You know? yeah. uh, 
Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. No, I was just going to say, I, you know, people love to love advertising. Like, you know, you can't go to, you can't go anywhere and you say, I'm an advertising. And they say, oh, you know, my favorite ad is, my favorite ad is, and they'll, they can quote every ad from the Super Bowl and they can, I, I would like to, I'm the, I'm a complete optimist in this because I really truly believe and this is probably me just wanting to believe this, but that there are, there's a part of a brain, part of the brain of a creative person that thinks of things that can't be artificially generated. It's just a way of looking at life. There's a, I'm a big optimist that, pe that people are, there's a human brain and human beings and insights and it's in it I see it in medicine I see it in automotive design I see it in that can't just be taken away and I really believe that about advertising I really do and Jeff I'm being that I'm 66 years old I can't remember some of the world's greatest campaigns but there were ads that really did help change the world you know, when you look back at them, you know, I'll use a local brand, um, what Arnold did with Volkswagen. You right. know, that was a dead brand. <laughs> and they gleaned an insight and they created that campaign. And they, you know, I think they're, I think the progressive ads are hysterical. You know, TV dad, I think and that's a new campaign right now out. It's, a, it's funny, you know, I, I don't know that that can be generated, you know? So, um, I think it depends on, you know, machine learning and yeah, learning, um, learning the, um, the, 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 really the, the algorithms of humor and how they're used and what you can replace things with to make things funny and so on. And, yeah. um, I mean, it's, it's not impossible. Those, I think the thing about Volkswagen being dead in the water is a really good example of where the AI would probably be stumped. Like when a brand is totally dead and has yeah. has no relevance anymore, yeah. what the what 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 What's what insight? information what information could the AI access to bring it right. forward? I think humans would really be more more useful in that situation somehow. You know? What do you think, Jeff? Jeff? Not, Jeff, my heart is breaking that you don't. <laughs> That creativity cannot be mimicked or copied. I'm like, oh, come on. Come on. Okay. What, what, what do you, it's gonna be what do you think, Yeah. Yeah. TK? Uh, oh, yeah. So I guess uh, in the beginning, we'll see as it unfolds, but we'll have some sort of a bimodality separating equilibrium going on where lots of uh, mundane ads or not so good ads might be replaced by the AI. And people, folks like, you know, Je you know, masters like Jeff and Kathy, who knows all, you know, it has the Smart sense man. of this. Smart man. <laughs> and, and also, you know, knows the, the, the tools and, you know, have you know, a team, you know, thinking on how to best use this would then have, I, I, I feel like would have like a, a longer tail, right? Like uh, on the masters actually, you know, might have a better time then also the ones that are boring and maybe not so important might be replaced by the AI. Um, I also want to point out that generative AI capability is in massively scaling all kinds of multimodal data together, compile it and present it in a, a human understandable way uh, called multimodal learning. For example, you, you know, let's say you want to advertise a company uh, it can actually soak up uh, previous logos, uh, mission statement, you know, 10K reporting, what people talk about on Twitter, Insta how, what people <laughs> tag on Instagram, and then combine That's amazing. And, then, yeah. Yeah, and find a, 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 multi, like a representation uh, that incorporates all of this. And then not even that, just like, you know, you can do many combinational creativity, such as like, you know, give me a mission statement of, I don't know, uh, Mercedes-Benz, but if, um, uh, 
I don't know what other company, if a Google were to come up with the Mercedes Benz uh, uh, mission statement, what would it be? Then you know, algorithms can try to come up with some combination there. So yeah. then Jeff and Kathy <laughs> would take a, you know, algorithms will generate lots of these. And then Jeff and Kathy might put a master final, a fi a final touch to make it ridiculously good, right? So I think there might be some sort of a, a longer tail happening. Well, and that's oh. what I mean about the taste, because you still have to have the taste to pick the thing out and go, that's the one that's the best, and I can improve upon it by making it red, you know, or some like, like, but the yeah. day I can definitely help you get to that spot yeah. that DK is talking about, where you have a whole bunch of things in front of you. At the same time, having a menu of things, as we know, is, is a limitation too, because there'll be things that aren't on that menu. And it's our job to think of those things. And again, it's 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 human nature to be lazy and not and not push yourself that extra mile beyond the things that are on the menu. We got to remember to do that. <laughs> yeah. So some uh, we have uh, an anonymous person asking, uh, with the addition of AI involvement in creative processes, with the perception of people in advertising, will the perception of people in advertising industry be devalued somewhat? And this kind of goes along with that question of, uh, are we going to, are, are in the discussion we were just having, are we um, taking fewer people who have a lot more experience and maybe are top of game, but are we going to start losing the people who are, you know, who are just, they're, they're good, but they're not, they're not any better than, or or the clients will just say, I can do this good enough. As you, you had said, Jeff, is there a, a good enough that takes care of 50% of the business and now we only have 50% and is that gonna uh, re either reduce wages for everybody in advertising or does it just reduce the number of positions that are in advertising? Um, you know, I, I don't think, I'm sort of not like Kathy on this. I don't think that people think that highly of advertising until they get specific and you go, well, what about the progressive campaign? They go, oh yeah, I like that actually. You know, I, I think generally they don't like advertising. Like I've, I've said to people, you know, in advertising, if you, if, you go, if you go to a party and you tell people you write books, the person that you talk to doesn't immediately think of the crappiest book they've ever read and say, did you write that? But that's what happens in advertising. They go like, wait a minute, you don't do that. You don't do that one with the... So, like, most of the time I'm, I'm like, no. I completely yeah. disagree with but, that. I completely but, but, disagree with that. Everyone, the next, everyone loves to feel like they're an expert in the advertising. They do. Oh, you, but, we, but I was just thinking about what DK Rhode was Island. saying. So we, we I, I, was, <laughs> I was thinking about what DK was saying and going, Okay, if you're an astrophysicist and you train the AI on, you know, galaxies far away, looking for um, um, discrepancies in the light and so on, and you just let it run and it runs and runs and runs and discovers something for you, you don't get this. You, you don't immediately think less of that astrophysicist for doing that. Why? Why should people think less of us for using the AI? I don't get it. No, so, and I don't. I, I agree with. Uh, no, and I, having been in advertising for a long time, every 10 years, I'm told we're all going to disappear and be, you know, considered yeah. irrelevant. It happens constantly with every new invention. And I'm a big believer in you have to embrace change because it's coming. And so take it or leave it. You know, you have to embrace change. And I just truly, my only, my only true got to believe is that there's a part of a human brain and I'm going to die believing this there's a part of a human brain that's creative that is rare and unique and can't be duplicated and you can you know algorithm it to death but if I thought that wasn't true it would it would depress me to the to, to the nth degree. Like I, I truly believe that, and I believe that about you, Jeff, and you know the work you've done and the things you think about, and you know people I've known that have been incredible advertising people, and then went on to be amazing painters and amazing. I, there's some just something 
I would love to believe that humanity can harness technology, but I would hate to believe that technology will replace humanity. That's well, it won't as long as we keep our taste levels high, like mm -hmm. DK was saying, I think. As long as we're as long as we're pushing ourselves to, to do better than what yeah. we're seeing. Because that's what creativity really is. It's looking at the solution that people are doing right now and going, but they're not thinking about it this way. They should do this. And you know, we can yes. still do that. And maybe that's the okay. new creativity. Maybe technology is the new creativity. So uh, so Kevin asked something right on this this point. He said, do you think AI deserves credit for playing a role in creative idea? Yeah. And will there be will there be some value put on a hundred percent human created idea versus an AI assisted idea? Or will everybody use AI? Period. It just is going to be it's a great question. Is, is there any do, do, do you? Do you, both of you that are in the advertising area, do you uh, think that one process is less valuable than the other? Everybody's going to use AI. It's all a question of how you use it. Everybody's yeah. going to use it. Yeah. It's going to be there. You, it's like, why, why, and yeah. why wouldn't you? It's already there. Yeah, you, you know? have to embrace it. Yeah. And figure out how you're going to use it. Yeah. You're absolutely right, Jeff. But I, I guess all I was saying was it's not going to replace it's you. Like, it's, it's, it's like, it's like Jimmy Breslin said, it's like stopping water with your feet. It's going to happen, you know, <laughs> you can't stop it. That's good. Okay, so uh, now since we're in the ethics side of things, Shuba asks us, um, will AI reduce biases? This is going to be good for, uh, for DK to start. Will it reduce biases and ads that arise from human blind spots like H&M's coolest monkey in the jungle or Dove's whitewashing ad? Um, so what, what do you, what do you think about, uh, biases that we're going to see? Yeah. I mean, I think this is weird. This is still an active area of research, right? So, um, we have gone through as humanity a few years ago when what happens if you use AI without, uh, a sort of a training wheel or, um, like a checks and balances, like for example, like algorithms being used to. Uh, make a decisions about parole being racist and things like that so i guess um uh, to an extent that if it's not used blindly uh, it could actually help for example you could imagine uh, uh an algorithm that tries to go actively searching for a data set or experience that's not widely available Maybe it's blind uh, sighted by just you know a couple a few humans, and then present that to the humans. Then humans can probably incorporate that. So I I don't know. I guess this is like a tool, right? I don't think it there's an automatic sort of answer yet. This will increase or decrease. It's just uh, as Jeff and Kathy mentioned, just how people use it. You can it can go either ways. I would say. Yeah, because you know the AI is going to have access to every racist joke that's ever been told how will it know that this is an inappropriate thing to use as to, to emulate as something funny and especially you know there are racist jokes that are all over the internet that people think are really funny that that the that the, that the, that the they won't know that it will just go look at it. everybody thinks this joke is funny i'm going to emulate it and do this so right. it's, it's gonna it's gonna take some time to milk that kind of thing out of it like dk saying I, it's to put some guardrails on it or whatever you called it, it's it's going to take time. It's going to take time. Scary DK, concept. Do think, DK, do you think that um, uh, it will be able to monitor itself? Is there will it will we be able to say um, is there any you know racist bias to the this ad that I'm doing? And will can it can it itself decide or help decide? That's a great question. Um, mm. Uh, I mean, in a way that people reacting to something and recording it, and then it'll just get a sense of, hey, there might be something wrong there. It can definitely do that right now. And this is how ChatGPT is sort of trained, right? So right. people just giving feedbacks and it, the same techniques can be uh, applied. Um, then also you can mix these uh, statistical machine learning that learns by examples and some sort of rule-based uh, put up guard guardrail, and if there is, you can specify. Hey, if this is uh, this algorithm is trying to put out something that you know resembles 
uh, that 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 seems like racist or is not appropriate or is uh, making a remark that is harmful uh, that that's not you know politically correct or you know then yeah I mean you could you can definitely I I, I can imagine uh, setting something up like that. I think it would be very helpful to to imagine a time when the AI could be trained to detect that stuff and help us find it and help us help us realize un you know uh, um, unrealized kind of uh, unintentional um, unintentionally racist stuff in the things that we make. You know, um, I mean, look at that uh, that Bing um, that Bing search chat thing in the New York Times this past week that had a whole bunch of scary, somewhat inappropriate kind of stuff in it. And Bing was like, oh yeah, well, we can get that out. You know, I think that that will start happening. You know, they'll start going, yeah, we better not, don't don't use that word anymore. And uh, um, and start, and, and, and by the way, there'll be different brands of chat, of, of, uh, of, of AI that you'll use. And some of them will be better at this than others. I think there'll be a competition for this kind of thing, which will be healthy, you know, that, There'll be one that, that comes forward and actually does a good job of this, um, and people will will champion it and use it more than one that doesn't. So, but right now we think of them as all the same, but they're going to start differ differentiating more and more. Jeff, do you ever forward. worry that everything's just going to be whitewashed? Like, um, no, but, because well, I think there's something healthy and people that can, that can only happen if we let it happen. Again, it's a taste thing. You know, it can only happen if we let it happen. And if um, if people that aren't, you know, that aren't of that kind of uh, mind are making these products, you know, they have to they have to have a bias for it not being that way. Yeah. That could be bigger than that. Just to just to give like fun example in the history, uh, there was one time when Watson learned to curse and speak in inappropriate language by, you know, uh, copying the, uh, the the all the slang, uh, the Urban Dictionary, and then they had to like, I like quote it. unquote, yeah, lobotomize it. Microsoft before OpenAI, they released something called Tay on Twitter, and it was learning from <laughs> uh, users on Twitter. It became like the worst version of humanity within 24 <laughs> hours. So they, they actually, it started with like, hello world. And then like within 24 hours, it, it started becoming like anti-Semitic and, you know. Yeah. 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 It was terrible. Interesting. So I guess we learned from that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what so I mean. Look at, how, look at how we did learn from that. I mean, the fact that that happened, we learned from it. And and that's what's important. It's the taste thing again. I mean, if we learn from that stuff, then it's a positive thing. If we don't learn from it, then it dumbs us down and, and gives way to our worst selves, you know? Yeah. Well, one thing I also wanted to mention that is that a lot of these large models, large language models like ChatGPT or the models that learn from what's online, it's inherently biased because they're only by it's there is a bias in what goes online, right? So I think one advertising yep. example that I think was uh like a sort of like a good example, um, whether for it's uh for layman or the AI uh experts or, or literally everyone, Heinz had this marketing campaign where they asked uh Dally 2 from OpenAI what uh a draw a picture of a ketchup. And of course, because yeah, well, of course, because it learned from internet, whereas there is gazillion different images of Heinz ketchup, it's going to spew out something that looks like Heinz. So in a way, it's like obvious, but in a way, that's the saying, look, ketchup is dominated. But again, um, that's probably because I don't know the market size uh, in the world and how many different ketchup brands there are. Um, but that that might be biased because you know just Heinz ketchup just happens to be a lot online. So I guess we have to be cognizant. Uh, you know, we have to be aware of that. Yeah. That that is that is a really interesting phenomenon to point out because you know going back to the um, the racism thing, you could imagine a country in which you know one of the minorities is incredibly um, incredibly per, um, persecuted. So everybody online persecutes this minority and it becomes the Heinz ketchup thing, you know, so that, yeah. yeah, it becomes, it becomes accepted. You know what I mean? It becomes, 
the right. AI accepts it as like what everybody's thinking. And that's dangerous. That's yeah. dangerous. I think there's yeah. going to be, it, it sounds like there's going to be a, um, a whack-a-mole situation where, you know, it, it's going to go in one direction and we're going to try to say, no, that's not the right direction. And it's going to, it's going to continue to, it's going to continue to come up with different ways of, of being maybe not appropriate. And then there will be some, some people that actually want to promote that, right? There's going to be the misinformation, malinformation, disinformation that's going to be promoted by certain tools that will, um, We'll look for those things, right? So we already have those tools. They're called Facebook and Instagram, <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> yes, that, that is true. Um, so uh, let's let's pull. We have lots and lots of questions here, but uh, um, uh, let me let me pull one up here. So um, one of them is just directly to you. Stephanie asks uh, uh, Jeff, uh, "How does your agency plan to use?" AI and the creative process and and are you using it and and uh, is it coming being part of your uh, your everyday uh, processes? For sure, we are we are looking into using AI to do really rudimentary stuff. It's not not brain surgery the way we're using it. I don't think it has any ethical problems. It doesn't have any dumbing down problems. It's doing like really low level stuff for us. Um, we've experimented with doing higher level things with the with the products that are out there. Um, and, you know, we've actually made an installation at the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, where you go in and there's there are like these big uh, TV screens that are and you you use your you use your mobile device to type in a 350 character version of a dream that you've had. And the thing will paint that dream in the style of a particular painter of the day. So we pick a style of, a, you know, um, David Hockney. It'll it'll paint your dream in David Hockney's style. And then it will add your dream to five other people's dreams and make a tapestry out of them for 20 minutes that's displayed there. So that's, that's, that's using it for the good. It's kind of corralled in a good way. People have gone in and given the, of course, given like obscene dreams to it. And there, it, it, it's it's it goes through Dolly too, and there are some guardrails on it. They're not a hundred percent, um, you know, they're not a hundred percent effective, but they're pretty good. Um, and and you know the, the you want you want to be able to paint a scary dream or even a sexy dream, but you don't want it to be pornographic dream because it's in a public space. So it's it, these are really hard things for to teach a machine to do, frankly. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sympathetic, you know, uh, but so, you know, the, the intent is good there. That, yeah. That's, that's a, that's a use of it. You're asking, are we using it? Yeah, we are. So one, one more question I want to ask and then, and we'll do a, just a, a wrap up for each one of you to, to, to give some opinions, but uh, a quick question here is, is uh, somebody brought up about deep fakes. So uh, with deep fakes, um, we can start taking famous people and putting words into their mouths and, and make them look like they're saying something that uh, they may or may not uh, uh, actually say or do. Or um, And with individualized advertising, you may not even catch it. I mean, in, in uh, you know, if they put it on TV, then they can catch it and they can say that wasn't me. But what do you think about deep fakes coming into the advertising world? We've we've used deep fake. We did it. We did a deep fake version of Salvador Dali that's at the museum, made from you know um, interviews with the guy and you know and sounds like him. It looks like him. It like recreates his size, his presence. He acts like Salvador Dali, but he talks about the Tampa Bay Bay um, Rays score of the day and things you know things that make it clear that it's not Dali. Um, that stuff is you know that 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 is extremely dangerous in many ways and you know dk can talk a little bit about the kind of watermarks and so on that they're trying to make now to keep us aware that things are deep fakes um and as soon as somebody comes up with a you know a way to to watermark it somebody comes up with a way to beat the watermark so it is whack-a-mole for sure yeah sounds like blockchain is coming back in uh i'm afraid we're running we're running out of time here so uh, how about one minute for each of you or just a, a comment from each of you on what you want our audience to take away from this 
interesting conversation. Oh boy. Jeff, I'm going to make you start. Although it, just getting back to deep fakes for a minute, we have Fox News to do that. So, um, she, th there's so much of that out there now that, and people people suck up everything and believe it. It's scary how much people can be fooled in our country. So um, yeah, anyway, I'm going to okay. pass it back to you, Jeff. Yeah. yeah you know, I'm going to have DK go first because I, we right. talk way too much about advertising. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I guess uh, I think uh, one thing I want to keep saying uh, is that it's very hard to predict how this uh, landscape will evolve because all the every prediction I've had and the the, the people I learned for the AI professors and scholars had it's it's been broken right so I remember uh, back in undergrad uh, AI professors saying the game of Go will not be beaten for a couple of decades it was beaten literally like eleven like, I don't know, uh, 12 years after. The next day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it has taken an exponential curve. And I also want to mention that, you know, the as long as there is data, it is quite good at, we, we have, it's, it's a great function fitter, right? So um, it's hard to make a prediction. Uh, but before I, like, you know, going into much details, I kind of want to say like what I'm in excited about, like, you know, when, when will the virtual reality come? Um, you know, the, when, will be, when will it become mainstream? But once it becomes mainstream, you can imagine uh, AI algorithm that just, you know, creates a, AI, a virtual reality world uh, from text on the spot. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, you can maybe create like a avatar on the spot based on existing data. I think that would be really cool. And we are very close to that. Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and uh, lastly, I wanna say that well, I don't know what kind of creativity these tools will enable, you know, different types of creativity. And I think it's an open question that I think I'm fascinated about and we'll do some research on it. Great, thanks. We're nice. really, we're at, at, at 4.30. So a sentence from each of you guys. <laughs> My sentence is, you know, we have to be the arbiters of taste. We have to be the ones that keep it from doing things that we don't want it to do. There is no government agency that's as smart as DK is to, to, to limit this stuff. And, you know, we need people like that, that, that have a, an ethical compass to, to, uh, to control this thing. Because as my friend Jim Riswell, who comes and does seminars at my place, says to the young artists and writers, um, you have to do better than free pornography online because it's free. Oh, this was just such a pleasure because I had not had been able to spend time with Jeff ever before. So Jeff, thank you for this honor. Um, thank you. So fun to hear from document who's clearly you know the next face of you know the group that's going to be controlling everything we know and learn and um so i was thrilled to be able to meet you i just still am a huge believer in humanity <laughs> and i just hate the thought that we're all going to just give into the fact that artificial intelligence is just going to take the world over because for all the reasons we talked about um so okay um good good, good way to uh to I'm conclude believer, it that was he's gonna gonna dominate that's a big believer in the human brain good well a big thank you jeff kathy dk it was a great conversation um and thank you audience for coming and your questions you were you're quite uh, connected thank you very much Next month, we are going to have Vincent Stanley, Director of Philosophy at Patagonia, to discuss the innovative changes that uh, what the, probably the most socially conscious companies now uh, owned by the earth. So watch for announcement for that and other upcoming webinars at insights.bu.edu, as well as our Insights podcast that I'm sure you'll enjoy. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And thanks, thank you, Dave. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Dave, Jeff, and Kathy. Thank you. Nice to meet you guys. All Thanks right. So much. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye.